With chapter three, we now turn to the history of ancient Greece. Uh, and I think most of us know that Greece is in Europe, but we have the map there. So to be more precise, Southeast Europe, very close to the modern state of Turkey. Uh, so that kind of situates it. In order to really fully appreciate the history of ancient Greece, we do need to start by considering the geography. So on the whole, Greece is relatively small. I, I actually once visited Greece. I drove from Athens to, uh, to the West Coast in roughly six, seven hours. So I mean, you know, relatively small, uh, but, but a, it's a very mountainous area and with a very kind of, you know, craggy coastline. Like if you were to actually stretch it out into a straight line, you'd have a, a good deal more coast than you might imagine. Uh, but because of the kind of mountainous terrain, and you know, with mountains, uh, particularly in the southern part of Greece, not particularly high mountains, kind of like, uh, you know, very large hills, but nonetheless, kind of like, uh, in many ways, separating different communities. So they, they tended to develop uh, very much independently of one another, very often kind of pursuing different paths, even though they, you know, they shared certain common civilizational elements. Uh, and with a kind of strong sense of their own uh, individual identities, you know, whether you're talking about Athens or Sparta and, you know, feeling very strongly independent. Um, and the other thing that's really relevant to, you know, any uh, study of the history of ancient Greece is that from a pretty early point, they would begin establishing colonies throughout the Mediterranean. So very quickly spreading Greek culture uh, throughout the Mediterranean world. Now, we usually begin the history of the ancient Greeks with a people known as the Minoans. Uh, so this would be the earliest civilization in Greece. So actually, they were based on the island of Crete, not on the mainland. Uh, and, you know, so in some ways, very distinct from later developments corresponding to the mainland. It is a Bronze Age civilization beginning around 2800, ending in 1450 BCE. Now, the term Minoan is not one that they use for themselves. The name is a reference to the legendary king of Crete uh, from Greek mythology named Minos, uh, an individual associated very strongly with the story of the Minotaur, which you might have heard of, a kind of mythical half-man, half-bull creature. Uh, but it's not what they call themselves. It's a term invented by historians uh, and archaeologists. Now, in part, this reflects the fact that we really uh, haven't been able to decipher their language, in part because we've, we've not really found much by way of written records, such as might help us to decipher the language. We do know that it is very different from what would eventually be spoken on the Greek mainland. Uh, also, their religion was distinct. These are not the ancestors of modern day Greek. Uh, I mean, no doubt they ended uh, up intermingling with the people who would eventually become the Greeks, but in some ways a very distinct people. Um, so, you know, we do know about their religion. It would seem that the bull, uh, maybe this corresponds to the myth about the Minotaur, the bull featured very prominently. Most of what we know, though, comes from the archaeological record. Probably the most important archaeological site would be the Palace of Knossos, the political center of this civilization. Uh, and mostly we're talking about an enormous palace complex uh, on the basis of which we know they were extremely rich. It was a very prosperous culture, a very complex civilization. Uh, one very interesting aside that uh, in connection with the archaeological dig, they at some point discovered a very large labyrinth or maze, which if you're familiar with the story of the Minotaur is quite interesting. According to the legend, uh, the Minotaur resided in a labyrinth. Occasionally, uh, victims would be thrown in there as a kind of sacrifice to meet their death at the hands of the uh, Minotaur. It'd be near impossible to find your way out. Uh, of course, this doesn't mean that there was really a half man, half bull creature, but you know, nonetheless, it is kind of interesting that they found this. Now, when we talk about the, you know, the period during which the Minoans flourished, so they started around 2800, you know, probably reached uh, the height of their civilization around 2000 and carried on to 1450. Most of those are kind of rough estimates, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, there's not like this one specific date where they suddenly became, 
uh, this powerful civilization. The date 1450, though, as uh, marking the end of that civilization, is actually very precise. Uh, what happened in 1450 BCE that the island of Crete was hit by a massive tsunami triggered by a volcanic eruption uh, from roughly the volcano roughly corresponding to the modern day island of Santorini, which if you even looking at this map, you can kind of tell that it, uh, the island is the uh, kind of the crater of the volcano. But in any event, this basically caused the Minoan civilization uh, to collapse in a very sudden and catastrophic manner. Uh, and up until then, they had been you know, very active in the Mediterranean, heavily engaged in trade. We know that they traded with the ancient Egyptians uh, among other Mediterranean people. But after 1450 BCE, they never really recovered. After that, we tend to shift to the mainland where we focus on uh, a newly emerged civilization known as the Mycenaean civilization. Uh, in connection with a fortified site that goes by the name of Mycenae, though in some ways better to refer to it as an archaeological site. Uh, and what's really interesting about Mycenae, Mycenae is a name that appears in the Greek epic, the Iliad, uh, usually attributed to the Greek poet Homer. And up until the uh, late 19th, early 20th century, pretty much believed to be entirely uh, mythical, like the stories related in there. Uh, and so some of you might be familiar with the, you know, kind of the main plot of the Iliad. You know, basically a, uh, a prince named Paris was visiting Mycenae from Troy, uh, became infatuated with the queen who went by the name Helen. Uh, she felt the same way. He kidnapped her, brought her back to Troy. And this eventually led the king of Mycenae, Agamemnon, to rally the, uh, you know, the various city-states of ancient Greece uh, to go to war with Troy, right? Helen often referred to as the face that launched a thousand ships. And again, up until the late 19th century, it was generally considered that this was you know, entirely an invented story, completely mythical. Uh, one amateur archeologist at the time, a German fellow named Heinrich Schliemann, uh, so amateur in the sense not affiliated with any university. Basically, he was extremely wealthy. He funded his own uh, archaeological expeditions. Uh, and in fact, uh, first became famous for discovering Troy, right? Up until then, considered to be entirely mythical. Uh, you know, many of his contemporaries, uh, particularly those archaeologists uh, associated with the universities, uh, were, were pretty much mocking him. He actually used the Iliad, descriptions of battles of the geography around Troy, to locate the archaeological site of Troy. And he actually found it. And we're pretty sure that that, 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 it, that is the actual site of Troy, in, you know, roughly in what corresponds to present-day Turkey. Uh, so he would do the same thing with Mycenae, again, using the Iliad as a guide, and eventually found the uh, remains of the fortified site of Mycenae. I say fortified site, it's kind of a city, but as we're going to discover, Mycenaean cities are rather smallish compared to, well, certainly compared to modern day cities, but even to cities uh, from the ancient world. And in fact, eventually they would find a number of such sites throughout Greece, referring to all of them collectively as constituting the Mycenaean civilization, uh, you know, kind of based on, on the first site that was found by Schliemann. So what do we know about the Mycenaean people? Uh, first of all, they're of Indo-European origin, so they came into the Greek mainland from outside, uh, probably arriving somewhere around 1900 BCE, uh, and then eventually flourishing between 1600 and 1100 BCE, so somewhat overlapping with the Minoans, uh, but then carrying on after the Minoan civilization came to an end. The Mycenaean civilization probably reaching uh, its height around 1400 to 1200 BCE. Uh, and again, you know, like uh, we find a number of different sites corresponding to this civilization. They have certain shared elements. Mostly they consist of very smallish cities that are in some ways glorified fortified palace centers where the royal family would have lived, maybe some of the warrior elite, 
but the vast majority of the population, the quote unquote civilian population, would have lived in scattered locations outside the palace walls, would have primarily engaged in agriculture. Uh, in terms of how they saw themselves, right, kind of defined by their political elite as a warrior people, right, uh, people who prided themselves on their heroic deeds, who, who greatly respected martial skills, uh, though we know they also engaged in trade. And so I've put here kind of an artistic depiction of what the city of Mycenae. We do know also that uh, in connection with there being a quote unquote warrior people that they spread militarily beyond Greece, uh, certainly to the Aegean islands, the islands surrounding the mainland, but also as far as Anatolia, roughly corresponding to the modern day state of Turkey. And this probably finds a correspondence with Homer's Iliad which, you know, if we think about it, broadly speaking, may be an account of their military adventures. You know, whether many of the specific details accounted for in the Iliad are actually true, you know, whether Agamemnon, the supposed king of Mycenae, actually existed, uh, all of that is very hard to say. Uh, so, for instance, you see uh, the image in the bottom right-hand corner, uh, often referred to as Agamemnon's death mask, was discovered in Mycenae by the archaeolo uh, archaeologist Schliemann. Uh, you know, that's what they call it. Uh, would seem to correspond to someone who was a political elite, perhaps the king. Whether it was in fact Agamemnon, we'll probably never know. Uh, having said that, it is again interesting to consider that Schliemann was able to find both Troy and Mycenae by treating the Iliad as a historical account of battles that actually happened, right? Like using the geographical descriptions uh, related to certain battles and the city of Troy itself. Uh, and in fact, when they started digging Troy up, they found evidence of a huge battle, which, you know, when dated, could possibly correspond to the, uh, the battles being described in the Iliad. Uh, but again, we have to be careful, right? I mean, you know, much of what is described in the Iliad, you also, you know, also features very prominently mythical creatures, the gods, and so forth. The Mycenaean civilization will eventually come to an end, but unlike what happened with the Minoans, it will not be a sudden and catastrophic end, but rather a kind of long, drawn-out period of decline beginning around the late 13th century BCE. We do know that the city of Mycenae itself was torched, set on fire around 1190 BCE. This would seem to correspond based on other archeological evidence uh, to a new people invading from the north, Greek speaking people. And, and these in fact are the, uh, the people who will go on to found the classic Greek civilization, right? That, uh, we often think about when we think of ancient Greece. Uh, just as one kind of brief aside, I should have mentioned it earlier, but the image that you see there on the left, uh, which corresponds to the site of Mycenae, often referred to as the Lion's Gate uh, because of the statue on top of the gate, uh, which features very prominently of two lions, right? So, I mean, if you're a tourist visiting Mycenae, this is kind of, you know, the main event, if you will, when you get there. But coming back to the classical Greek civilization, that won't happen right away. We now enter a period often referred to as a kind of dark age, where Greece does seem to enter a period of declining population and food production, uh, though we have to be careful. We don't know a lot about what was going on during this period, uh, partly because of a lack of records, right? So as a historian, we always have to be careful about, uh, you know, uh, guesstimating too much when we really don't have accounts that can tell us what was actually going on. And, you know, having said that, some important changes are going to take place during these uh, so-called dark, uh, this so-called dark age. Uh, for instance, iron will replace bronze in the construction of weapons and farm tools. So this is going to be, uh, you know, a kind of very important development uh, as far as improving agriculture. Uh, when we talked about the geography of Greece, I mentioned that it's very hilly. Uh, related to that, you, you really have a lot of terrain that you can grow food on it, but it's, you know, it's, it's, it's not that easy, right? You really need kind of effective tools to kind of break up the soil and so forth. And obviously iron weapons will make, uh, make for more formidable armies. 
And it's also during this period that the Greeks adopt the Phoenician alphabet. The Phoenician are a people, uh, a civilization that emerged on the eastern coast of the Mediterranean in an area roughly corresponding to the modern state of Lebanon. And we're going to hear about them again later in connection with the ancient Romans, but one of the most important developments connected with them uh, is the invention of a phonetic alphabet. The term phonetic actually you know, derived from the term Phoenician. And so a phonetic alphabet is one where each symbol represents not a thing, right? Uh, we already looked, we talked a bit about kind of, you know, uh, the large numbers of symbols involved in hieroglyphics, cuneiform, and ancient Mesopotamia, because uh, you just have like, you know, hundreds, even thousands of symbols representing different things and then different ways of combining the symbols, right? Phonetic alphabet is where each symbol represents a sound, meaning you can have a, you know, a much, much smaller set of symbols uh, in order to construct words. Right. And so derived of the Phoenician alphabet, the Greek alphabet will eventually end up with 24 letters. And of course, uh, the alphabet we use in English, which is derived of Latin, uh, also traces its roots through the Greeks to the Phoenician. Right. And by the way, even the alphabet used in Semitic languages has the same point of origin. Uh, so you can see the Phoenician alphabet. Uh, in that diagram on the top and then underneath the Greek alphabet. And I think if you look very carefully at the letters, you can kind of see, you know, where they correspond, right? Though obviously kind of changing over time uh, or often when one people adopt the alphabet of another people, uh, you know, their language might have certain sounds that didn't exist in the original language. So they have to come up with new letters and so forth. Finally, during this period, um, you know, this is where the epic poems, the Iliad and the Odyssey, uh, will eventually take form, right? So we often attribute these to uh, a fellow named Homer, uh, often considered one of the greatest poets of all time, but we should be careful. We're not sure that Homer actually existed, right? So, you know, uh, this might just be, you know, kind of a convenient way of referring to these two epic poems. And when I say epic, I mean poems that go on for you know, hundreds and hundreds of pages uh, that most likely were passed down one generation to the next orally. And, you know, from our point of view, that seems very impressive, right? That people would have memorized poems that went on for hundreds of pages uh, and then be able to kind of, you know, pass it down the line uh, and then eventually being written down. And, you know, so even if Homer did exist, it probably isn't the case that he just invented these epics of his own imagination. Right. So we're pretty sure that they evolved during this period um, and probably do reflect, uh, you know, the ancient Mycenaean civilization and certainly, you know, kind of uh, cultural ideals of, of this kind of ancient Greek people before the classical civilization emerged. Right. So the two main epics, uh, we already talked about the Iliad which is effectively about this war against Troy, often referred to as the Trojan War. Uh, there you see depicted the two main heroes of the conflict, uh, for the Greeks, Achilles, for the Trojan, Hector. Uh, some of you might have seen the movie Troy, uh, so, you know, played there by Brad Pitt and Eric Bana. Uh, but, you know, also kind of reflecting the ideals of that period, right? Kind of celebrating the heroic deeds of these great warriors, uh, you know, whose fame would greatly outlast their actual lives, you know, their names living on even until today. And then the second epic, uh, the Odyssey, uh, which is basically about one of the Greek generals journey home, a fellow named Ulysses, who was probably uh, famous more for being clever than heroic though he was also heroic. Uh, it's not that he was kind of shifty uh, in the sense of being clever, uh, but he had angered the gods. And so they, they kind of forced him to go through many different adventures uh, before he could find his way home. Uh, so this was kind of, you know, more an epic journey kind of story. I don't know if some of you are familiar with the, uh, the movie, Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? Uh, but that is actually the Odyssey resituated in the 1930s Deep South United States, right? So every every like kind of event uh, 
uh, every incident that takes place in that movie has a corresponding uh, incident in the original Greek epic. And, you know, again, for, for the ancient Greeks, right? So when we get to the ancient Greek civilization, these two works are going to be incredibly important. They pretty much are at the core of the curriculum of every young male, right? Uh, it provided pretty much all they needed to know uh, in order to flourish within ancient Greek uh, society, right? It taught the aristocratic values of courage and honor, and so very much reflected this kind of, you know, warrior ethic, if you will. And, you know, again, remembering, and this was the, the case with the Mycenaean and will be the case again, at least early on during the classical Greek period, uh, that the warriors constitute the political elite. They're a kind of aristocracy. And the Greeks really regarded Homer, uh, Homer's works as authentic history. As far as most ancient Greeks were concerned, all of this really happened. And that brings us to the classical period, which pretty much begins to emerge around the 8th century BCE with the beginning of the polis or city-state, right? So city-state in some ways very much like what we saw in ancient Mesopotamia, uh, where each city is its own distinct political entity with its own political system, its own laws, its own jurisdiction that usually included some of the hinterland and completely independent of other city-states, right? But the term that they used in, uh, in Greek was polis. And, you know, in fact, today, the word polis kind of simply means city. And, you know, very often we have cities today in the United States, for example, that have the term polis in it, like Indianapolis, uh, Annapolis, and so forth. Back in the ancient Greek period, uh, each city stayed very distinct, but they did have certain common features, right? So pretty much every city state would have had an Acropolis. That would have been the highest point in the city and that is where the temples honoring their gods and goddesses but you know much as in mesopotamia ancient mesopotamia each city had its own patron god or goddess uh, and that's where they would have honored them and there would have been again much as in ancient mesopotamia uh, many rituals associated with keeping the god or goddess happy below the acropolis would have been the agora or marketplace uh, so this is kind of the public space where business takes place, but also where politics happens, right? This would be where assemblies were held uh, and where uh, and we're going to learn that uh, probably the thing that the ancient Greeks are most famous for is the birth of democracy, right? So kind of developing uh, a kind of political tradition where, you know, all citizens would be part of the process, right, of legislate, legislating, making laws uh, and then executing them. Probably the most famous Acropolis is the one in Athens. So, you know, by the way, the term polis meaning city, but it is also where the word politics, our word politics is derived from, right? So literally referring to a community of citizens with political rights. Um, and, you know, being a citizen meant that you had uh, the right and obligation to participate in government. Now we should note uh, only male citizens had that right. Uh, you had citizens who did not have political rights, women and children. And then most city-states in ancient Greece would have had a sizable population of non-citizens made up of slaves and resident aliens. So at this point, we might consider, well, how did this kind of you know, democratic form of government come about? And it might surprise you, a lot of this had to do with certain kinds of military reforms that took place from an early point. Uh, so, you know, back in the day, armies would have been uh, based on warrior elites or warrior aristocrats. They would have, you know, been kind of the, uh, the basis of the military, which would have been primarily centered around the cavalry. Uh, but at the end of the eighth century, they started to initiate certain military reforms that really saw a kind of diminishing of the importance of the cavalry, right? These men who fought on horseback, but who were highly trained, right? Who, I mean, who were devoted uh, to martial skills. They were professional warriors, if you will. 
Uh, and so uh, these military reforms kind of diminish the importance of the cavalry in favor of an infantry, uh, which would, be, would have been made uh, up primarily of non-elites, individuals who only fought part of the time, uh, but you know, most of the time would have been, in most cases, farmers, or you know, they might have been engaged in other kind of activities. Uh, but the idea was, uh, in connection with developing the infantry, they would develop certain kinds of strategies that did not require uh, the same level of skill that was involved within a cavalry-based military. Now, the infantry, in the case of the ancient Greeks, were known as hoplites, right? And so the idea is that they would be organized in a very specific way uh, in a kind of formation known as a phallus where they would be kind of, you know, really compact. Uh, so it did require a high level of discipline. You had to line up uh, and really remain very close to your fellow soldiers. And you would all have your very lengthy spears thrust in front of you. The main thing was that no matter what, you could not break formation, whether offensively, right, in which case you're pushing forward, and by virtue of holding together, you're pretty much able to plow into your opponent and likely divide their forces or defensively, wherein you would then kind of go into a crouch position. But imagine everyone doing this simultaneously and then putting their shields up over their heads where effectively you become like a turtle in a shell. Uh, but again, it's very key that you do not allow the enemy, your opponent, to break your formation. As long as you hold that formation, it's very difficult for them to take you out. And it's going to prove to be extremely effective. Uh, Greek, the Greek military will uh, you know, very often be victorious when coming into conflict, even with much larger armies. Uh, so highly disciplined, but again, not requiring uh, you know, individuals who have been trained to be warriors from the day they were born. Now, with respect to political reform, one important uh, consequence of this is going to be a phenomenon known as social leveling, which, by the way, we see sometimes in our military today, right? The phalanx would have been made up of both aristocrats and small farmers, right? So it's no longer a military made up entirely of warrior aristocrats uh, who then justify their political elite status on the basis that they alone defend the people. They are now fighting side by side, right? People who are politically at the top, people are at the bottom. So on the one hand, that will minimize class conflict, right? Because you kind of know one another now uh, and are able to relate to one another. On the other hand, it will raise expectations among non-aristocrats who are going to challenge aristocratic control of the state. From their point of view, we're putting our lives on the line too. There is no justification for you having, you know, this kind of warrior elite from having all the political power. Before we go any further, right, uh, from this point forward, I'm going to focus on developments in two different cities, uh, which really represent kind of two different directions things might go, uh, go in from this point forward. Uh, so the two cities in question are Sparta and Athens, which are also probably the two most important cities in ancient Greece uh, in terms of later political developments. So, you know, if Spartans and Athenians really saw themselves as being very dif different, right? First, they spoke different dialects of Greek, right? So, I mean, right from the get-go, you would be very aware of who was Spartan, who was Athenian. Uh, and the other major way in which they differed and this is a bit of a simplification, right? But so in both cases, you're going to see greater participation by the uh, larger community of citizens politically, uh, but towards different objectives. For Spartans, it was primarily about stability, conformity, and order, right? Uh, as a Spartan, you did not really want to be different from other Spartans, and you were kind of more concerned about the welfare of the overall community. Uh, than about any kind of individual rights or desires. Athenians are going to be different. They're going to kind of stress individual differences uh, and individual freedom to a much greater extent. And arguably, when we think of democracy today, we're probably thinking more of kind of the Athenian conception of it. 
But let's look at Sparta first, right? So some of you might have seen the movie 300. Uh, and, you know, obviously that is a bit over the top in terms of how Spartans are depicted. Uh, having said that, uh, I'll mention uh, at this point a conversation I once had with a classical historian, right? Someone who focuses on the ancient uh, Greeks and ancient Romans. And uh, she basically put it this way, that uh, Spartans would probably have loved that movie because this movie pretty much depicted them the way they saw themselves. Uh, also kind of depicted the Persians the way ancient Greeks often saw them, right? So in that regard, uh, you know, the story was written by a fellow named Frank Miller, obviously had done some research, right? It wasn't like he was just kind of making this up, but this really did kind of depict kind of, you know, how the ancient Greeks would have depicted uh, both Spartans and, and the ancient Persians uh, within their own storytelling. So regarding Sparta, Right. So first of all, Sparta no longer exists as a city, right? But if we're thinking about ancient Sparta, the archaeological site located in southeastern Peloponnesus, Peloponnesus referring to that what almost appears to be an island that is connected to the mainland simply by this very, very small strip of land. And from a pretty early point, Sparta had developed into a strong community that was eventually able to bring the surrounding area under its control. And then at some point, they initiated a series of military reforms, uh, often attributed to the possibly mythical lawgiver Lycurgus. I, we're not sure that it was one individual or that this particular individual even existed. We're pretty sure this, you know, and if it didn't happen all at once, it you know, took place somewhere between 800, 600 BCE. And so, you know, I think most people are familiar with, you know, this kind of idea that Spartans were very militaristic. So when you look at these reforms, I think you, you get a clear idea of why that is. So from a pretty early point, they were already thinking about whether children, uh, particularly males, were fit for military service. Uh, right from the start, in fact. So if a couple had a sickly child, they would put them, they would leave them out in the wild to die. Right, the idea that they had little value, uh, but if by some miracle they should survive, then you know they had been mistaken about how sickly they were, or the gods had ordained that they should survive. Uh, at the age of seven, children entered the barracks. Education stressed military discipline right from the start. Uh, and so then, 13 years later, at the age of 20, Spartan males enrolled in the army. And you're pretty much in the army for most of the rest of your life. Uh, and given the possibility that you might die in battle, very likely for, for you know, actually for the rest of your life. Uh, you're allowed to marry from that point forward, but you have to live in the barracks until 30. And it is not until you're 30 that you are considered mature enough uh, to be allowed to vote in the assembly. Right. So this kind of the idea until you've been a bit salted, until you've had some military experience and so forth, uh, you're not really ready to uh, responsibly take on uh, the, your role in government. Uh, you know, I just want to throw out there as kind of food for thought. Maybe they had a point. I'm not saying that we should adopt the same thing here. But, you know, very often we debate about, you know, whether you know, people who vote are properly informed about the various issues they're voting on and so forth. Uh, in particular, we sometimes wonder about political figures who are prepared to send young men to, men to war when they themselves have never done military service. Uh, so, you know, that kind of logic underlying this. Now, you're going to remain in the army until the age of 60. So again, you are in the army for a long time. So even after you're allowed to participate in the assembly, uh, if you vote in favor of war, for instance, there is a, you know, a great likelihood that you're going to be on the front lines. Uh, so it's a very personal decision in a way. Now, Spartan government was, uh, for the most part, an oligarchy. I don't think we've talked about that term yet. Oligarchy refers to the idea that a small number of very powerful and influential, very often wealthy families uh, control politics, right? Have, you know, a great deal of influence relative to everyone else. Uh, and we're going to see that term cropping up quite a bit. And we could possibly use that term to describe our present day political system in this country. Uh, in any event, I don't want to get too deeply into it. When we look at the ancient Romans, we'll, 
you know, kind of explore that avenue of thought perhaps a bit more deeply. Uh, and w one very interesting aspect of Spartan government is that when they were at war, uh, at least as far as military affairs were concerned, uh, they kind of ditched the whole democratic process, right? Uh, you had two kings who were actually responsible for military affairs and who led in battle, right? And, you know, in fairness, if you're, you know, actually at war, you know, sometimes democracy uh, can actually get in the way a bit, right? So, you know, that's why even in uh, a modern day army, you don't have a democratic process, you have a very clear hierarchy, chain of command, and so forth. So at this point, I'd like to turn to Athens, which by 700 BCE had become a unified polis, uh, pretty much under the control of aristocrats. And then, you know, now we encounter this period of kind of military reform that we already discussed, moving away from a kind of cavalry based army to one uh, based on the infantry, the hoplites, the kind of social leveling effect this had. And so there's kind of a growing discontent with the existing political arrangement, many commoners, uh, non-aristocrats, not happy with the fact that aristocrats have all the political power. And then at some point, an economic crisis, right? So we have growing economic problems, kind of a growing uh, discontent among the people. So effectively a crisis that threatens the power of the aristocrats. And their thinking is pretty much, you know, what is the minimum amount of reform we need to implement that will get people to settle down, but still kind of leave us in charge. And at some point they turn to a rather popular reform-minded aristocrat named Salon. Uh, you know, basically he had ideas about how to make government work better. And they're like, listen, we're putting you in charge. You're going to govern this. This begins in 594 BCE. But you know, they like the idea that he's an aristocrat. Like, you know, you kind of know what the, what the, the deal is, right? Like, you know, reform, but not too much. And so we are going to see limited reform. And, you know, from our modern day perspective, it might seem falling far short of proper democracy, but it is laying down important principles that will pro provide a foundation for moving further. So we often refer to this as the birth of Athenian democracy. And there are two primary reforms here, right? One, uh, is to redefine the criteria for participating in government uh, away from uh, birth, you know, that you had to be born into an aristocratic family, and that's effectively what made you an aristocrat, uh, to a criteria based on wealth. And helpful here is to kind of realize that the commoners most unhappy with the, the existing political arrangement till then would have been wealthy commoners, you know, individuals who had achieved wealth and status and felt that, you know, they kind of had it coming to them. They were being denied their right to have a political role, a, a role in the political system. The other reform would be to grant citizens greater rights vis-a-vis -vis government. Uh, up until then, uh, you know, there wasn't really this idea that government exists for the benefit of the people, right? Have, you know, in many ways, if you were in government, you use your position uh, to, you know, to further your own interests, right? And of course, certainly government officials do that today, but we see that as something very wrong. That wasn't necessarily the case up until this point, but there was a feeling, you know, kind of a growing sensibility that people in government were abusing their position and using it to exploit uh, particularly commoners. Uh, so to address that concern, citizens now had the right to bring court charges against any government officials. So kind of establishing a basic principle that government should be answerable to all citizens. Government is responsible to the people. So the foundation has been laid that the guy who's going to bring it home, often referred to as the father of democracy, is Cleisthenes. So first of all, after Salon, Athens goes through a period of tyranny. Basically what happens, and by the way, the term tyranny in this case being used in a very specific way. The term actually comes from this particular episode. Uh, which, by the way, happened not just in Athens, but many Greek city-states, where people became really dissatisfied with the aristocracy, uh, and then eventually turned to a very popular individual who had wealth and power, who was able to seize power, and then to govern as a tyrant. 
Uh, but usually it was someone very popular and someone who actually governed in a way that was very beneficial for the people. The problem often became when uh, they died and were replaced by their sons and they often proved not to be quite as effective and to be abusive of their power and so forth. Uh, but the main thing is this did a lot to further weaken the aristocracy, kind of opening the door for a new kind of more democratic form of government. And in the case of Athens, uh, it's going to come under Cleisthenes, again, a reform minded aristocrat. You know, again, maybe this idea of, you know, how much reform do we need to implement where the you know aristocracy still is kind of the dominant element, but uh, you know, the rest of the population is able to accept it. Uh, so he's going to establish what becomes kind of a new basis for Athenian democracy, an institution known as the Deme. So what is a Deme? And, you know, first of all, let's think about how representation works in our present day government, right? You generally have the idea that your representative is based on where you live, right? So if you live in New York, you have a particular individual as your senator. If you were to move to California, you would have a different one. Same goes for the House of Representatives, you know, in terms of what district you live in. But this actually is, you know, up until this point, this is a, would have been considered a rather radical idea. Representation up until this point was based more on your family group, uh, to some degree on your social group, you know, if you think about it, you could divide people into representative units based on almost anything, right? It could be based on professions, it could be based on uh, wealth and so forth. Uh, it doesn't have to be based on where you live, right? But this is the reform that Cleisthenes is going to implement. The Dema basically is the fundamental representative political unit now based on geography, which means that you have a mix of people with the same representation, right? Within one geographical area, or shall we say district, right? You have rich, you have poor, you have aristocrats, you have commoners, people of different professions, uh, people of different kinds of backgrounds and so forth, who now all have the same representation. And, you know, we could discuss the pros and cons. I think one obvious pro is that they would have to look past their own you know, specific interests in terms of wealth, status, social grouping, and so forth, right, to think about what's best for the larger community. Uh, so more precisely, these demes were gathered into 10 tribes, right, with each choosing 50 members each year to serve on the Council of 500. And that is where the real power lay, right? They're the ones who prepared the business to be handled by the assembly. Now the assembly included pretty much everyone, well, all male citizens, right? Anyone considered uh, to have political rights. And the assembly is a really good example of what we call popular democracy, right? It, wherein everyone who is a citizen votes, right? So the assembly made up of all male citizens had the final authority in the passing of laws following free and open debate. Right. So Council of 500, is de uh, 500 determined what they would actually be debating, what they might actually pass, but they did have the final word on what became law. And uh, by the way, the word democracy derives from a combination of two Greek terms, uh, the one meaning people, demos, obviously the term deme related to this, and kratia meaning power. So democracy effectively meaning people power. So this pretty much concludes the first half of our lecture, uh, though we might finish by asking the question, do we in the United States have a popular democracy? Uh, well, that would mean that everyone pretty much is, you know, every day voting on, you know, different legislation, debating and so forth. Obviously, we don't have that, right? We have a representative democracy. Uh, where we elect individuals to represent us in this process uh, and hope that they actually reflect our will. Um, so, you know, we could debate the, uh, when the founding fathers were trying to develop a system of government for this country, they actually, you know, kind of uh, 
debated, you know, popular democracy versus representative democracy. You know, obviously one argument would be that the United States is much too big for a popular democracy, that that works much better within a smaller community. Uh, we do have some examples whenever you have what we call a referendum where everyone votes on a particular issue. Uh, and sometimes when you go to vote for, you know, elected officials, you might also see like a few different proposals that you get to vote on, you know, it could be like legalizing marijuana or something like that. That would be an example of popular democracy. But for the most part, we don't really have that. Uh, and in, in fact, most countries do not. In any event, we'll finish there and we'll be picking up with kind of developments reflecting more uh, kind of conflict, the Greeks encountering the Persians, uh, and then civil conflict between different Greek city-states and so forth. Uh, and also, you know, look at some of the cultural developments uh, connected with ancient Greece. But we'll finish here for now and talk to you later.